So I got, my, I got a phone call. This happened some time ago, but I was in my house and my phone rang and I answered the phone because it said Emma's name on it. Emma's my oldest daughter and she happened to be home. It was summertime and she had taken the four-wheeler on a little adventure. And now she's calling me, but she wasn't home yet. So I figured, oh no. So I answered the phone. Dad, I'm stuck. Oh boy, anyone? Anybody had one of those, two of those, three of those? Like, okay, where are you? So I drove to the swamp that she tried to drive through and see there's the four-wheeler. Okay, I get the straps out, tow straps, get the truck. I can't, we tried to figure out different ways that we're gonna pull the four-wheeler out. Can't get the truck close enough to it. We worked for hours and hours. My neighbor showed up. We're working for hours and the, you can watch the four-wheeler go Just a little more, every about 15, 20 minutes or so, you know, goes by. Wow, there's more water there than there was earlier. Yeah. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Now the pressure of, oh, I don't know. And another hour, I won't even see the four-wheeler is upon me. And I don't know exactly what I'm going to do. And uh, for all of our effort, the four-wheeler would not move. All the effort that we had done, we had the straps, we got extra long things. We tried the, you know, the cranker thing. We're at the cable and the cranker. Mitch, what's it called? Come along. Yeah, no, no there's no coming along. It's sitting there. It's all down in the mud. So after hours had gone by, I just like, we're ready to give up. I don't know what to do. And I'm very frustrated. Any dads know what I'm talking about? You have to hold down that frustration that you just want to, you know, let something out, but you know it won't be helpful. And then you got, you're working harder to deal with that than to actually get the four-wheeler out of the mud. Any, anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So then I had this thought, and it must have been the Lord and here's the thought. I wonder if it's in neutral. So I walked over to the four-wheeler. Hang on, guys. Click, click. Put it in neutral. We pulled the four-wheeler right out. It was in park. Shame. I don't know what was more shameful, my daughter trying to drive through or the fact that I didn't even think, let's put it in neutral and let it roll out. I know those things like that don't happen to you, but they happen to me. And I wanted to share that today because I know a lot of Christians that want God to break out in their life, but they're in park. Everything's there to get them moving, but they're in park and they ain't moving. And they're wondering why God's not breaking out in their life. It's time to check what gear you're in. And I'm bringing a word today about some men in the Bible who are kind of an inspiration to me. They're not necessarily the great stories that if somebody said, tell me a great Bible story, they're not necessarily some of the great ones. I'm sure you've heard of their stories. I hope you have. They're not one, they're not one of the great 12 apostles in the New Testament, but they're a great inspiration to me. And I wanna share with you what happened in their life when they got out of park and got in a position where they could be used and rolled 
If I could go back to the four-wheeler picture. Now I'm going to move away from it. Would you stand with me and take your Bible? And I want to read to you a, a continuation, Acts 6. I'm going to read to you a continuation of the word that I preached on a Sunday morning not long ago called Planted. If you weren't here, you can go back on YouTube and read it. I'm not going to re repeat that. It's from John 12 where Jesus gives his disciples a decision to make to either die and be planted and become many seeds or live life all about themselves and just be one seed. Planted. Go back and listen to it. Pastor Daniel's given me permission over the however many times he allows me to preach. I love every time. I'm going to make a series out of this about becoming many seeds, planted, becoming many seeds. And today, I want to highlight to you the power of serving. The power of serving. Take a look at Acts 6. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and to the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip. Uh, this is a different Philip. This is not the same as one of the disciples because it already said the 12. And there, this is a different Philip. Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas from Antioch, a convert, convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. God, come speak to us today. In the realm of being planted, both planted in you and planted in the house of God, Come speak to us today. God, you've put this in my heart to share, to bring out. At this time, at the end of, as summer is drawing near to an end, and as we look forward to what's taking place already in this new season, God, come speak to me today. Come speak to us today and help me to communicate this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We find a growing church in Acts 6. If you've been a part of the members class, you know that we strive to model our church much after the early church. The early church or the first church is this one, the one in the book of Acts. This is where the church started. Prior to the book of Acts, there were gatherings, there were places of teaching, but a, but a location and a gathering, uh, house to house or in a public setting, people declaring the gospel, Hearing about Jesus and the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, that's the church. And you don't see it until the book of Acts after the day of Pentecost has come. And you see it, it's growing rapidly. And the apostles, who are the leaders of the church, have a big decision in front of them. The church has grown to the size that they can't keep up with all they've started. And they have a, pre, a feeding program that's getting out of control. And there's a lot of fighting and they're asking each other, is this really what we're supposed to be doing as the leaders of the church? And they had a decision to make, what should we do with this feeding program? It's obvious what their decision was. We want it to continue. We want this program to continue, but it's good. someone else is gonna have to lead this because it's eating up all of our time, which should be, sp should be spent on the word and prayer. Now they... They could have said, this is not going to work out. Everyone's fighting. There's a whole bunch of dysfunction here, and it's eating up all of our time. Let's just cancel the feeding program. No, no. They're into growing. They're into expanding. And you know this is the way they are because they chose to keep it going and to put someone in charge of it that could take it to the next level. 
And this is what we try to model here. We're a church that wants to keep growing, keep expanding. Where else can we expand? We don't want to cancel anything. We want to get everyone on the, we want to get people in the right place of serving on a team so that they can bring growth to areas. And we want to expand into new territories, maybe where we don't have anything yet and maybe where there's not a ministry yet. Let's get one going. That's why we're going to Anchorage this Saturday. Amen? Let's do it. The apostles desired growth, so they looked for leaders. You will realize that as a church grows, there are shifts in structures, shifts in leadership. Uh, a good example would be me. For 20 years, I was the children's pastor, and I loved every minute of it, sort of. Now, God gave me a great burden, and uh, through a tremendous vision in 1998, and and I have been obedient to that. There came a time where some of the giftings that I have needed to be used in a different area, and so my wife has stayed involved and is leading children's ministry and doing a phenomenal job ministering to kids, even right now. And now my role has changed because our church has grown in, in such a way that there's some of the, some of the abilities that I have need to be in different places. And that happens frequently in a growing church. And that's a great thing. In 20, 20 years of being at Kings, I've ministered to groups of, you know, like a life group size of kids. There might be 10 or 15. I've also ministered to kids. Uh, and our, I think our largest setting was 600 at a kid's service. And there's, you better change the structure or everyone's going to the hospital. You can't do it the same. Uh, you might as well park an ambulance on the side. So growth dictates changes in the structure, changes in the way we do things. We've made some big changes even this week with the launching of the school. Great job, school. So proud for you. Keep going. So who was selected? I want to spend just a few minutes talking about who was selected to take over the feeding program. The first thing you want to notice is what the, the 12 instructed them to do. Take a look at verse 3. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known. Everybody say known. I want to pause right there for just a moment. It was so important to the early church that the leaders they were going to put in place were people that were known among them. And I want to say that's the way we function here as well. We don't allow rogue, you know, great people to come in and just all of a sudden walk into a leadership role. We have steps of leadership, starts in the discover track. We have a pathway to leadership for life groups and teams. And the same thing happens uh, in our prayer time right up here. You know, we have designated men and women that we have, uh, what do you call it? They've got something on them. Yeah, we, we have given them a lanyard saying they are known and they can come pray for you. And that's so important for us to keep in mind as our church grows. And it was important in the early church that they were aware that there's false teachers that will try to sneak in among them and try to take their influence. And they're, throughout the New Testament, you see them warning, Paul writing to the churches, watch out for people sneaking in to distract you and to de derail you. So these, they have to look for someone who's known. To be known, they had to have some sort of evidence in their life that they were born again, and what else? Full of the Spirit and wisdom. So it wasn't somebody brand new that they just decided, hey, uh, that guy's not doing anything. Send him down there to the feeding program. No, they looked for people who were known among them. Someone already engaged with them, already in fellowship with them. It was important to them. They were highly selective of who was going to move into these leadership roles. They had to be trusted, known to them. 
They had to be full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom. I want to highlight to you who wasn't selected. Now, it doesn't say there, but by by not saying it, they're sort of saying it. I want you to notice that they didn't say, look for men among you who are good at feeding programs. They didn't say, go out and find the most talented people that you can find, the most gifted, the ones that are really good at administration. Go find the ones that are really good at settling arguments between people. That's who we want. No, that's not who they were told to go find. And I love this. That's why these guys are some of my heroes in the Bible. Because the 12 apostles knew if it's someone full of the Holy Ghost, they got everything that they need to do what God's called them to do. And God can give them what they need to do the role by the Spirit. So find me someone full of the Spirit because they can tap into the power of God. And that's what we need more than brilliance, more than diplomas, more than someone telling you how great they are at something. Give me somebody full of the Holy Ghost. And I'm sharing that with you because I'm also bringing a charge to us to get going, get out of park, and get serving in the house of God. And it could even be in areas that maybe you're not even gifted or or talented or competent in. Just do something. And God will help you in that area by the Spirit. Paul writes to the Corinthians, and you know what he tells them? He tells the Corinthian church, it's God who makes me competent as a minister of the gospel. Think about that for a minute. Paul was brilliant. He was mentored by one of the great teachers of the law. He had all the scriptures memorized. What was it he said? Pharisee of Pharisees and on and on, all of his his accolades. But then he tells the Corinthian church, it's God who makes me competent as a minister of the gospel. God can equip you and empower you to do what he's called you to do. And they knew that, and that's why they said, give me somebody full of the Holy Ghost to lead these program, to lead this program. They didn't, they didn't say go out there and just find anybody that wants to be in charge. No, it had to be known, and they had to be full of the Holy Ghost and full of wisdom. So what became of these men? This is great. This is why I wanted to bring this word, because there is power released when you serve. There's, there are things that God will bring about in your life because you're, you've positioned yourself in the role of serving in the house of God. And I want to point some of them out because two of these men in the next two chapters highlight what God brings about in our life when we're faithful in the realm of serving, whatever that role might be. The first one is Stephen. Take a look at what happened to Stephen. Look at verse eight. Now, we don't know how long, we don't know how much time has transpired from the time they were selected to be the feeding program leaders and verse, and this story of season where, Stephen where he's seized. But there was enough time for verse seven, the word of God to spread the number of disciples in Jerusalem to increase rapidly and a large number of priests to become obedient to the faith. So a good amount of time has gone by. Stephen, look how the Bible describes him. Now he's been been selected and he's serving. He's in charge of the feeding program with these other six guys. And it says, here's the description, verse eight. A man full of grace and power did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Wow, it wasn't the apostles. It was Stephen, the feeding program guy, that God was flowing power, miracles, signs, and wonders through. Wow, that gives me such confidence because when they were looking for people 
to do the feeding program, it reminds me of me because I, my role here is a lot of nuts and bolts. Figure out how to do it, how to make it happen. And yet, in, even in that type of a role, Stephen can operate miracles, signs, wonders. It wasn't just restricted to the great apostles. Even the feeding program guys could be used by God. And so can we. Moving on in Stephen's story here, you know, he gets arrested and he gets the opportunity to declare the gospel, the greatness of God, what he's done through Jesus to all these teachers. And taking a look at verse 54 of chapter 7, after he's done preaching to them, they're so angry at him. And then look at this, verse 55, but Stephen full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. How many people in the Bible do you know that saw, that saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God? How many? One. Stephen, the feeding program guy. It wasn't, it wasn't the great disciples that were Jesus' disciples. It was or let me go back. It wasn't the apostles who used to be the 12. They are great men. They started churches. I'm not saying that. I'm trying to bring out that these guys that got elected to run the feeding program saw some of the greatest things that ever happened in the New Testament. That's incredible to me. It's, one, it's, it's why there's such heroes to me. Stephen was martyred. He became the first martyr. And at, right after he dies, tremendous persecution breaks out against the church. Now we're in chapter 8. And as we look at chapter 8, we go to the next person who was on the feeding program team. His name's Philip. Not Philip the disciple from the Gospels, who was one of the twelve this is a different Philip. Look at chapter 8, verse 5. We find out what happens to Philip. Great persecution came to Jerusalem. And if I back up and tell you what happened, on that day, it's, it's chapter 8, verse uh, 1. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. Look at what the Bible says here. And all except the apostles were scattered. All, all of them, except the apostles. Who's all? Who's all? It's all of those that were believers. How many were saved on the day of Pentecost? 3,000 plus? They're all gone. Tremendous persecution. Everyone but the apostles left. And everywhere they go, they're preaching the gospel. Those that have been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Verse 5, chapter 8. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in that city. And then Philip has this divine appointment. He has a visitation with an angel. He has a divine appointment with, with, a, uh, this, this Enoch, with going down the road here, this uh, eunuch going down the road and reading. And uh, the eunuch gets saved and wants to be baptized in water. So Philip goes to baptize him. Verse 39, when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared somewhere else. Wait a minute, what? He disappeared. The feeding program guy. Had a visitation of, the, of an angel, obeys God, baptizes this guy, and vanishes. Who else in the New Testament did anything like that? Philip. Philip disappeared and showed up somewhere else preaching. These are the feeding program people. 
who were selected because they were in fellowship. They were planted in fellowship. They were full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom and they got picked to lead a feeding program and some of the most astounding stories in the New Testament happened to them. I see a direct link to serving in the house of God and God's power breaking out in your life. I know because I've experienced it. I can't get enough of it. I love serving in the house of God. What else can I do? Pastor Daniel has asked me so many times and so has when I lived on Maui, been asked by Dr. Morocco, what is it you wanna do? I'll do anything I can do for the team. I just love serving God. What, what can I do? I just wanna do something for God. There is power released in serving. These men, now we don't have any more stories about the other folks that are a part of the feeding program, but we have enough with these two guys to, to see that through their serving, what they became as a picture of multiplication in their life. And if you're taking notes, I'm gonna quickly point out these things that were multiplied in their life. We see it happening after they started serving with the feeding program. They had multiplied power in their life. We just read some of the examples of it in Acts 6 and 7 and 8. And we can experience the same thing in our life, but not if we're in park. Remember the four-wheeler. Couldn't get it out. Everything was there, but it was in park. The same thing applies to us. We have to be active in the kingdom of God. It's a part of being planted more than observation more than just showing up to get a check mark. I'm doing something for the Lord. And power is released. When I serve God, power is released. I become a conduit for God to flow through me. I'm convinced that the giftings I have, I think many of them I was not born with. I'm convinced many of them God has decided to give to me later in life after I was faithful in serving in the small areas. He gave me some giftings to use in some larger areas. I'm going to make a statement here that might be confusing, but try to hear what I'm saying is at this point of serving on the team for 25 years and being involved in kids church since I was 12, that's 37 years involved in kids church if you're doing some math but I won't tell you how old I am you can do some math I'm I no longer can tell the difference in what what talents and gifts I was born with and which ones I'm operating in now because they look the same I can't tell a difference in them and I think in my own personal life that there is giftings and talents that God has dropped in me because I was faithful in the little. And the same thing can happen to you. That's why, I was, that's why I was pointing out that they were looking for men full of the Holy Ghost, not full of every talent that they needed. Because God can give you what you need to accomplish. And I know that's happened in my life. Multiplied power. We can have multiplied power in our life, multiplied fruitfulness. Stephen and Philip became more than just supervisors of a program. They were elevated into greater, broader kingdom purposes. But it started with them being elected. It's the first time you see their name. They were elected into this, into this purpose. In our life, we find the same principles of fruitfulness at work. When you're faithful with the little, he'll make you ruler over much. Do you know what the reward is in the kingdom of God for doing a good job? More jobs. Oh. <sighs> to him who has more will be given. But to him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. That was Jesus giving a principle of fruitfulness in our life. We find that increased principle at work. So as we're faithful, planted in the house of God, and serving in whatever ways we can, in here, in this house, it would be 
serving in the life group process, uh, life group ministries and home groups or the teams. Those are our, those are our avenues of serving. We find increase taking place in fruitfulness. Paul writes, and in, Paul writes a powerful scripture. Take your Bible. As we look at some of these other related scriptures to serving and what happens in our life when we serve, take a look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13. 1 Timothy 3, 13. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. Our name, we have a multiplication of influence, multiplication of our, of our name, our credibility, if you will. Not how popular or what, what happens when you say your name and all these people cheer. No, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about your credibility and your influence. It grows. Those that have served well gain an excellent standing. He's talking about among the fellowship, planted among the believers. The more you serve, the more faithful you are, the more excellent you serve when you're serving, the more your credibility rises, your influence rises, and elevation is on the way. But not only that, our faith is enhanced. There's a direct correlation to our faith and serving. Something happens. I can't explain it. I don't know how that works. But I know this scripture is too, true. That there's multiplication in my faith when, when I'm serving. As I'm serving. Talking about being planted, the power of serving, the effects of it manifested in our life. God's power, fruitfulness, influence, our faith. And then the last thing I want to point out that gets multiplied is our reward. When you're planted and you're serving, there's going to be a multiplication of reward in your life both in this life and in the life to come. Look at these powerful scriptures. Colossians 3, 23 says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Ephesians 6, verse 7, Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. Paul is writing to people to talk about their employment in this culture that they were living in. They were slaves to someone. You can go back and you know, see what all that means, but he's talking about the person that you work for serving as unto the Lord. But I'm bringing out the fact that God is a rewarder. He sees what we do, and he wants to reward us. If he didn't want to reward us, Paul wouldn't be saying, hey, get a better reward, serve wholeheartedly. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 16. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels. And then he will reward, there it is, he will reward each person according to what they've done. One of the emphasis we have at King's is we want people to look good on Judgment Day. We have this clear perception that there is a real day called Judgment Day and each person stands before God and they're going to receive what is due them while they were alive in the body. That would be 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm not making that up. You are going to stand before God and your life is going to be put before him. I don't know what that looks like. It'll be a reward day for some and a not so reward day for others. I, I would highly suggest you make it a reward day for you. 
You, you can make it a reward day for you. I'm, I'm trading my whole life to make it a reward day for me. And I'm also convinced that on that day, every single person, including myself, will say, I wish I'd have done more. I should have done more. I should have done what really counted. Wow, I spent half my, half my life pursuing things that today have no value standing in front of God. And I'd only spent a little time and effort. I only traded a little bit of my treasure for something now at the end of all time really matters. I'm convinced every person will have this moment with tears running down their face, realizing they had 30, 40, 50, 70 years to make their life count, and they didn't. And they won't be able to go back and redo it. There's no redos. So get multiplication happening in your life. Back to planted. Jesus said you have a choice of what your life's going to be like. You can either be one seed or you can be planted and become many seeds. Today we're talking about defining, defining being planted, and today is the joy and the power of God released in serving in the house of God. Get out of park and get going. I'm so thrilled. You know, we had... This Saturday, we have Anchorage opening. And there's people that are trading their Saturday to go to Anchorage to help make it happen. We also have a rally on Saturday for our next season of life groups and teams. If you somehow fell off the life group leadership, decided not to have one anymore, I want to encourage you, get back on the train. Get out of park. Get going. Get doing something. If you're new here and you're looking for a good home church that's going to get you, uh, get, get blessing flowing in your life, this is a great one. But we do emphasize here, do something for God. Don't just be an observer. Get in the discover track. Join a team. Get in a life group. This next season of life groups and teams. And there's already people experiencing this. Did you know that everything that I'm declaring here that's happened, this is a real thing that people in this house are experiencing because they're serving. I'm not just telling you something that might happen. This is a real thing. It happens in my life and it can happen in yours. And if somehow you're not on a team or you're not involved in a life group, now's the time. Get out of park. Everything's there for you to receive all God has for you, but you might be in park. Get planted. Get going. We have a new goal this upcoming season. 200 life groups. Do you know we crossed 100 back in the spring? We're aiming high for 200. We're aiming for a multiplication to take place. And what's thrilling is the people that rise to the challenge are going to experience this in their life. They're going to experience God's power being released. They're going to experience fruitfulness that they didn't realize was going to take place. They're going to experience their faith growing, and then they're gonna start seeing God's favor showing up in their life. There's people that are gonna be life group leaders for the very first time, they're gonna experience this. That's amazing. Go for it. There's so much coming your way. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast and it's enriched you and helped you in your life. If you've never made a decision to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, would you do it now? Pray this prayer with me right out loud. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die in my place. 
Thank you that he rose again from the grave for me. Forgive me of all of my sin. Wash me, cleanse me, and make me new. Thank you for loving me, and thank you for hearing my prayer. Amen. Let me pray for you. I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would touch each and every person that prayed that prayer out of sincerity of heart. I pray a breaking off of every assignment of darkness, any chain, any bondage, any habit that's not of God, that you would sever it and set them free. I pray and ask, Holy Spirit, touch them and fill them now and use them for your purpose and give them a hunger for your word and for the things of God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, text us, would you, so that we can help you grow in the things of God. Text SAVED to the number 907-357-2065. If you don't have a home church, we hope that you would find a home with us here at Kings, Alaska. If you're in some other part of the nation or the world, find a good local church that preaches and teaches God's word and grow in the things of God. We love you. God bless you. We'll see you in future broadcasts or in services. Praise the Lord.